to Pat one night after he had three martinis and couldn't find her, so he bombed Cambodia instead with very deleterious results. Anyway, um, I, I don't know. It seems to me it's pretty simple about Iran. We're not doing so well in the two wars we're in. Why go into a third one? But that's neither here nor there. So I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is it's not going to be rational when it does happen. And the consequences are going to be asymmetrical. I think the Iranians will not hit Israel, will not hit America. They will just pour everything they have into the oil and gas stuff in the Gulf and double the price of oil within a day. 40, you know, just give, take out 40% of the world's oil for us. Bam, bam. Just like that. The Navy's done studies in which they're afraid they would lose a carrier. Um, so let me just, two more things to get out of here. And then we'll do questions. And you know, uh, uh, lots of laughs, huh? Uh, it, you know, if I think I've had an upper concession, they're selling uppers in the corner, I'd probably do real, real, real well right now. So let me tell you two stories about go from the macro. Let's go from macro to micro. I'll tell you two quick stories. Abu, the VI massacre was, and here's where there's a lot of parallels with Iraq in this. In, in Vietnam, we went to war against a culture we didn't understand, um, and against an enemy we didn't see. And what would happen is, troops would get into combat and go there and be puffed up full of fighting. They were fighting communists. And what happened under Robert McNamara, who um, I'm, you may think the world of him, but I, I, I covered that building. I covered the Pentagon during the war, and I, got to, I stayed with him a long time. And he's basically a psychotic liar because um, sociopathic. He has no idea when he lies. It's just sort of ingrained. Just, you know, it's just I don't think he's capable really of dealing with what, what he's been responsible for along with a lot of other people. And so anyway, um, McNamara in, in 64, 65, 65, we were having trouble recruiting like we are now. And he lowered the, uh, the threshold, uh, the minimum threshold. It was called Project 100,000. And the idea was to get young boys who would otherwise were not qualified because of inability to basically um, get past third grade English uh, were, were put into the military. Uh, and it was largely minority, but an awful lot of farm kids. And, and this group that was, that was responsible, it was called Charlie Company of a company, task force called Task Force Barker that were attached to a useless, one of the worst divisions in the military called uh, the America Division. It was a division in which all the junk heaps went. About sometime early this summer, the CIA dramatically increased the number of people on the Iranian, uh, um, uh, Iranian what's the exact title? The, the Iranian Operational Group, uh, IO, whatever it is. They had one for the Iraqi war. The, the group, the, the, the group that met every day to discuss Iran, uh, suddenly was going to be augmented by uh, 100%. And every division in the CIA was supposed to give up 10 of their people. And one of my friends who was involved when they passed the word that we want 10 people from every division. And, and this is the clandestine action in what they call the covert operational area, not the, not the academic area. This is the area of operators. We had to give up 10 people to the Iranians for, because we're going to really, we're beefing it up. And what my friend said to me, uh, most of us, he was a division leader. He said, we love it because we can empty the drunk tank. You know, we just go get the most useless guys and shove them in. In any case, so this was a little bit like this unit of sort of guys that could get it otherwise. They got their basic training. They get to Vietnam in January of December, late December of 67, 68. They start patrolling. They spend about three or into the middle of March. They lose about 15 to 20 percent of their people. Snipers. They even have bungee pits in, in the jungle sometimes. Mostly snipers and bombs. 20 percent. They never see an enemy. And eventually, as they go along, eventually, inevitably, what happens is, particularly with bad leadership, um, the people began to take it. They take it out in the people a little bit. You slug an old man if he moves out of your way when you're going to a village because you're looking for combat soldiers. You can't find anybody. You can't find anybody. At one time early in the war, one of the generals announced that we're fighting the Viet Cong. They're go what he's, he announced, the, the commanding general of the 82nd, I think it was, airborne, he announced they were fighting in the Highlands. He said, all right, gen men, these guys, the guerrillas were fighting. They're farmers by day, guerrillas at night. So after that, they go to a village. Anybody will yawn, they started shooting at. So they had to three-man that. They would literally shoot at you, yawn. There's a guerrilla, bam, bam, bam. I mean, it's just that, that happens in war. So they were increasingly angry, increasingly frustrated, losing military is all about, as a soldier, I was a grunt. I was a, what they call a straight leg, one, 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 infantryman in my, in my lost youth. Um, you, it's all about 
loyalty, the buddy next to you. You go, you go fight. Not, you know, basically, it's, it's, the flag has nothing to do with it. It's your buddy. You're going to go. When he dies, you're mad. When he gets hurt, you're mad. And so a lot of guys got hurt. In March 15th, they're told, tomorrow you're going to meet the enemy for the first time. We, we know we have intelligence that there's a major unit there in this place called, it was called Pinkville, they called it. It was Milai 4, the village. And so the kids did what they did at that time. The, uh, the GIs toked it up. And the officers and the, list, the senior enlisted guys drank it up. But they did get up at 3 or 4 in the morning to, to kill and be killed. And they jumped on choppers and they went to the village. No troops there. Instead, they found 560. As I say, that's how many bodies were exhumed. It's a lot more than the two or 300, most people think. Women, children, old men making breakfast. Um, charcoal fires or whatever. And for some inexplicable reason, I hope it's inexplicable. It could be explicable, but I'm not sure. That would suggest that it happened more. For some reason, they gathered them into three ditches and they began to shoot them. And they shot them all day. We all, it was one of the horrible massacres. There was a photographer there I, uh, who had two sets. He was there for the Army newspaper, the Stars and the Stripes, with the camera the Army gave him, a black and white. He took propaganda pictures of soldiers doing, looking like the right thing with the other camera. He took four or five rolls of color pictures. What really happened? After I wrote the stories, he sold them the Life magazine for 100,000 bucks. I mean, smart guy, I guess. I don't know what else you'd call him. I don't like him. Um, well, I, I naturally wouldn't like him. Anyway, um, so they executed everybody. Just stood there and they put him in ditches and a farm boy shot. One kid in particular was named Paul Meadlow. And he, they, these are the M1 rifles. It was, I think they had clips of 16, semi-automatic. You had to keep the finger pressed. You know, and, you know, it wasn't like a real machine gun, but semi-automatic. You fire a lot of rounds and boom, just sort of constantly pressing. And then you put another clip in it. And among the farm kids who did it, he was one. He was 17 from a small city in Indiana. He shot a lot. When I, I later spent a, a lot of time not only doing uh, stories in a book about it, but about how it was covered up, institutionally covered up. Everybody, of course, knew about it in the system. And everybody was sort of massive lying, which is not unsur unsurprising, sort of normal for any system, um, but um, the Hispanic and black kids, which were much more of a minority then, particularly the, the blacks were more dominant than Hispanics, uh, a lot of them, I think I must have talked about 15 or 20 of them, maybe as many as eight or nine told me they fired high. They didn't dare not shoot, but damn it, this was Whitey's war, and you know, they didn't dare not shoot because if they were seen not shooting, they would get killed perhaps by one of their buddies. But the Whitey's War, and they had nothing to do with it. And later, some of them wore black armbands for a couple of weeks afterwards. But that's incidental. Uh, and uh, my sample isn't that strong. But I have a hunch there was some division on it. In any case, so they shoot everybody. And at one point, uh, they, they were in ditches. They were put in three large ditches. And they did a lot of shooting to make sure everybody died. We're talking about 150 or 200 in each ditch. And at one point, some, when it was over, they heard a keeny noise. And from the bottom of the ditch, some kid, about two or three, his mother had tucked him somehow, in some way, that protected him. He came crawling up through the bodies, full of other people's blood, climbed on top of the pile of ditch. And everything I'm telling you now is in every record. What I'm telling you now is in the record. And it was in the stories I wrote because I had it very early, but it turned out in all the various investigations, it's in the, it's in the official records, began running across the paddy, or what you will, we always, the cliche is the price paddy, but he began running across, and Lieutenant Kelly, who was the man that had been doing, has been fingered by the world as the, the great officer who was in charge of everything, a, a very ordinary second lieutenant, the first lieutenant then, one of six who was leading the shooting, but he became sort of the point for everybody in the subsequent histories. Kelly said to this man, Beedlo, Beedlo, the farm boy, who had been doing sort of an automatic shooting, he said, plug him. And Milo just couldn't do it. Tama won. And Kelly, with great con contempt, as everybody recounted, took uh, officers then had a smaller rifle known as a carbine, ran up behind the kid and shot him in the back of the head with his carbine. So the next day, they're on a patrol. They, got, they went to sleep. They got up and they were patrolling in the area as we did. And Paul Milo stepped on a line line and his foot was blown off to his knee, the right foot, right below the knee. And they called in what they call a medevac, a chopper to come, American chopper to come take him away from the, from the war zone. And as he was lying there waiting, he began to utter a curse, an oath. God has punished me, Lieutenant Kelly, and God will punish you.